Well, hello, this is Peter Combs from Bitamount.com and P.L. Combs Asian Art, and today is April 2nd, 2019, and as I mentioned uh, in the last couple of videos, we were working on putting together the price results and the auction information that uh, 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 regarding the sales that took place during Asia Week in New York during their 10th anniversary uh, last month in March, and uh, it was there was a lot of information. There's going to be a fairly long video, and uh, in case of any of you who are looking at this picture saying, who is this guy, I got a haircut over the weekend, <laughs> And uh, the lady that cut my hair was new, and uh, she cut it a little shorter than I anticipated. But that's okay. It's spring is here, and, and uh, she was very nice about it. But uh, that's the way it goes sometimes with barbers. All right. At uh, any rate, uh, the, 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 the sales overall did very well. There were some strange results, and there were some disappointments, as there is in every auction series. But overall, I have to say the auctions did quite well. And uh, we're going to talk a bit about what happened to the Marchant Bowl in a minute. But first, we're going to get started with uh, one of the one of the nifty uh, statues that we uh, looked at uh, during the preview a, a few weeks ago. Was this was that very nice uh, gilded gray stone figure of Buddha, uh, a beautiful example from Northern Qi Dynasty, which is. Uh, 550 to 577 uh, A.D., uh, a beautiful example. It was about 27 inches tall, uh, nicely done. There was a very good write-up on it by uh, Robert Mowry uh, uh, covering this uh, example. And uh, he, this had been exhibited at Eskenazi and Company over in, uh, uh, in Europe some years ago in, uh, in the 70s. It was a fairly well-known piece among collectors, and it did very well. It brought 1.4 million five uh, fifty five thousand dollars and this was against a 1.2 to 1.8 million dollar estimate so it sold right in the middle of its estimate uh, which was a, a, a good result it was a nice example and uh, uh, this was a particularly nice one they don't turn up very often as you know and uh, next we'll move over and we're going to take a look at the uh, long Quan celadon uh, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we uh, did the preview for the sale uh, this particular vase was quite pretty reminiscent of the one that was in the Fujita sale a couple of years ago, uh, with those fabulous Japanese, uh, that fabulous Japanese collection. This also came from a Japanese collection. It measured 28 inches tall. It was estimated at two to three hundred thousand dollars, and uh, in the end, it, it just about doubled its high estimate. It had an extremely uh, good result. It sold for five hundred and ninety-one thousand dollars. And uh, we had, I think we had speculated in the other video that this might do a bit better because of the uh, uh, the Fujita result, which everybody um, is keenly aware of. And uh, Japanese collections are just uh, renowned for great celadons from China. Uh, they were uh, very much coveted there, uh, especially in the latter part of the 19th and early 20th century. And there's some absolutely, as everybody knows, some superb collections there. And uh, this, this is certainly a, a very fine example. It did great. All right, now we're going to get on to one of the sort of disappointments uh, of the sale, which is the cover lot. It's never good when a cover lot doesn't sell. Uh, this was the Richard Marchant Bowl uh, from uh, his collection, and the Marchants are well-known, uh, highly respected dealers in London. Uh, this bowl had a, a very big estimate. Two to three million dollars. Uh, they don't turn up all the time, but this one didn't get off the ground. And there's a, I think there's a reason why it didn't get off the ground. It's this reason right here. Um, in Hong Kong uh, tomorrow, April 3rd, uh, this auction is going to take place, and this, uh, the, the, this is the Chen Man Lu. Uh, they are the collector, uh, the collectors, the two brothers that own this stuff, have decided to sell just a few things out of their collection. Um, one of them in an interview said recently he was planning on updating his, up, upgrading his collection, which made me sort of laugh. I said, how, how much further can you upgrade this collection? But that's what he said. And uh, there are, in this sale um, that's coming up, three of these mallow bowls, or, or three of these dice bowls, rather, um, that are uh, very similar to the one that was offered at, uh, um, um, at Christie's, uh, for belonging to Mr. Marchant. There's this one, and it has a, a much lower estimate, 383000 to 640000 and then there is this one, estimated at one to one and a half million dollars U.S. It's an, that's a really great bowl, by the way. It's a superb example, um, a wonderful pattern. And there is yet another one. Okay, this it's it's almost uh, cruel. There, there's many coming on the market. Um, there's another one also estimated at three hundred eighty-three to six hundred and forty. 
uh, uh, $1,000, the Walsh and D period. Uh, and it, I have to believe that this had an effect on the bidders in New York saying, well, if there's three of them coming up and all of them are estimated, you know, hundreds of thousands you know, of dollars less than the Marchant Bowl, um, setting aside any quibbling about quality and which is the better bowl, um, I got to think that this might have might have slowed down some interest in the in the New York example, or at least waiting to see how these do, and maybe there there will be some offers going back to uh, Christie's uh, to sell their 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 bowl there. But this was uh, this was a, a pretty shocking amount of stuff. And if you haven't seen that uh, seen this catalog, come over to bidemout.com. The, all the catalogs for the Hong Kong sales that are taking place now are, are up, and you can you can browse through them. They're pretty interesting. There's some great stuff. So I have a feeling that had a lot to do with um, what happened uh, um, uh, with the uh, Marchant Bowl. Uh, these things are all connected. And then we get back to this. This was that uh, really, I, I thought it was lovely. This was sort of rare, wandly, reticulated, uh, a walled uh, teapot. It was a nice example. And, uh, uh, you know, it was just, just very cleverly done. You see that same kind of articulation on bowls all the time, but not often on teapots. It was estimated at forty to 60000 and it did fine. It sold. It brought $43,750. Didn't blow away its estimate, but uh, it, it did fine, and, and it got to where it should, and, and it has a new owner, all right, which is always a nice thing. All right, and then moving along to this, this was that uh, quite spectacular, uh, the uh, embroidered, this was a silk embroidery of immortals, a Taoist birthday panel from the Qin Lung period. Uh, just unbelievable quality. If you came over and looked at this thing, um, a silk, imagining a silk from the 18th century of this quality surviving in such great condition. Um, the colors on it were still as vibrant and fresh as they were the day this thing was made. There's no signs of fading. There's no signs of anything bad ever happening to it. And it was estimated at $150,000 to $250,000, and it sold for $187,000 for the panel, all right, which is, I think, a pretty good result. This had a strong estimate on it for a, for a panel, but uh, it did fine just the same. And then moving along to this was that uh, really extraordinary 18th century dragon road, Lung Pao, uh, in yellow. Uh, very, very rare. You don't see 18th century robes turn up very often um, because so many of them just got worn out and discarded or, or, or cut up or, over the years and used for different things. You see a lot of 19th century and late 19th century robes, but these 18th century ones are very, very rare. And it had a three to $500,000 estimate, and it ended up selling, I think it was $399,000. So it sold right smack dab in the center of its estimate. It did just fine. Uh, just a, a, a terrific example. You know, I keep looking over to my left because I have my, my notes over here, so I, and I don't want to miss anything. All right, and then moving on, there was another robe, that Guangxu robe that came up right after this, also a very uh, a rare example and in superb condition. Uh, this, thing, this thing had a great color, uh, vibrant color, but if, if you look at it carefully, it looks as though the thing was never worn. All right. It looked like they wove, wove it, took it off the uh, rack, and stuck it in a box, and never, never saw sunlight. Never saw a bit of wear. If you look up here on the collar, is virtually nothing. No indication that this thing had ever been worn or used much at all. And uh, it did great. It brought one hundred and twenty-five thousand uh, dollars, which is a, a very good result for that. And then lastly, in this catalog, we're going to look at one last thing, and that was that the Yuan, the Ming Dynasty uh, Junware. It was a number three uh, pot. Uh, as we mentioned before, these were done in sizes ranging from 1 through 10. This was a number 3. It was a good size pot, um, about 10 inches tall, estimated at 2.5 to $3.5 million. Uh, it had superb coloring. The, the, the color on this, the flambe on this, was absolutely spectacular. And uh, it ended up selling for $3,015,000. All right. It was one of the one of the most expensive, if not the most expensive, porcelain sold in New York. I think uh, that week, but it was absolutely great. And uh, so overall, the sale did very very well, except for the disappointment of the cover lot. And like I said, it's never good when a color lot, a cover lot doesn't sell. But um, um, you know that that's uh, that's uh, the way it goes sometimes. But Christie's did a great job. Well, all the auction houses did a great job. All right. 
And then on to this. This was that uh, that painting that I had mentioned. Um, this was one of the, the Chinese uh, painting sale that Christie's had. And we had looked at it because I thought it was such a fascinating uh, bit of work. Uh, this was that uh, uh, remembrance of a, of, of a, Ming, uh, a Ming general um, and uh, a painting and an edict was put out uh, depicting his, his value, his, his, all of his battles and his history and the pict- all of the different pictures had script on them identifying what was going on. And at the time, I thought the estimate seemed awfully reasonable, twelve to $20,000. And I even wondered if it wasn't a typo. And uh, in the end, it did it did fine. It ended up selling for uh, eighty-one thousand dollars. So it went four times its estimate, which seems a lot more reasonable to me. Uh, um, and may, maybe they just didn't, didn't have a comp to go by to estimate it, or they were just trying to encourage bidders. Uh, but it, it did great, and it was worth every penny of it. I think it was just a great thing. Uh, you don't see these very often, and uh, this was a terrific example. And that was in this catalog. All righty. And then over here, Power and Prestige. This was that sort of small sale on bronzes, but they had some, some gems in here. I think only one of them didn't sell. I think all, all of these examples sold. And, um, of course, the cover lot were, were, the, were quite a, a spectacular on here. They weren't the most expensive things that, that sold. There was a bronze that brought more than twice what these brought. But these were very good, and these were TG TG Goose. Uh, and a pair of them, no less. All right, with great color, estimated at four to six hundred thousand dollars, and uh, they had a pretty good history behind them, good exhibition history, and they ended up selling for five hundred and forty-three thousand dollars, which was a very, very respectable result. And uh, getting a pair of these is, 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 you know, almost impossible. So I think they they brought what they were, you know, certainly brought what they were worth. All right, and then, but the most expensive bronze in the sale. Um, out of this catalog was this was that very uh, that sort of I, I described it as having a crunchy glaze that uh, really fabulous Fang Ding um, beautiful example uh, uh, late Shang uh, 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 dynasty uh, but but great color just absolutely stupendous color estimated at a million to a million five uh, had a pretty strong estimate on it. Um, but it was a great bronze, and it ended up selling for a million ninety-five thousand dollars. It did so; it did sell. It sort of sold at the at its low end, um, but I think it was pretty aggressively estimated. But but certainly um, a great object, and uh, now is on to a new home itself. All righty. But the, the, all of the bronzes in this sale did very well. This was a European collection, um, a nice old one, and uh, they obviously had a great eye. So the, so it was all good stuff. And then on to this. This was uh, two sales from the Irving collection. And this, these two sales uh, blew the roof off. I was just going to say it. Um, and we'll get to some, some of the, how some of the roofs got blown off in this sale. But, but the Irvings, as, as I mentioned before, were uh, legendary collectors. He, he and his wife began collecting at a, a very early in their marriage. She was, uh, I believe, a school teacher. And he went on into business and was uh, extremely successful and uh, fueled their ability to uh, build uh, an absolutely unbelievable collection. Part of it is at the Metropolitan Museum him now all righty and uh, just uh, uh, you know uh, fabulous things and um, we're going to start with this one this was part one I had them a little out of order and there's this uh, stoop uh, let's see here uh, uh, da, 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 part one we're going to get over here oh the jade cup yeah you remember a couple weeks ago we talked about this this was that really fabulous looking uh, white jade cut with the, with the cup with the chimera climbing up over the rim of it and uh, just a stunning color. All of the jades he had in his collection had amazing color. And uh, Mr. Irving and Mrs. Irving, they collected uh, Japanese and Chinese stuff. They had some great Japanese stuff in this sale as well. And it all did extremely well, uh, many times their estimates. And uh, he was not a big auction buyer. He bought mostly from very good dealers. He, 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 he liked to work with dealers, uh, to, I assume probably to get the education from them and, um, and to build relationships to get a shot at the best things that come in and uh, this this was uh, one of them this came from Spinks and uh, he pay, it was estimated at two to three hundred thousand dollars and it ended up selling for over two times its high estimate it went for six hundred and thirty nine thousand dollars but as we discussed a couple weeks ago the color on this was amazing the carving quality was amazing the proportions all of it just great and this thing was seven inches tall which is pretty big for, for a, a, a well-colored piece of jade like this so very pure color all right, and then we'll move over to um, 
this. This was uh, one of the big lots that they sold. It was uh, uh, that uh, amazing uh, inscribed Chinlung uh, uh, f uh, fish, uh, fish uh, brush washer with the twin fish on the bottom. And there was a nice write-up on this and lots of illustrations. And it's all inscribed on the back. And uh, you couldn't ask for any more than this. This was just a, a great example. And it ended up selling for uh, $2.8 million uh, against an estimate of... Um, uh, one to 1.5 million. So it almost doubled its high estimate. Doubling high estimates when you're in the millions is no small trick. But this was a, a, a really rare thing. And again, the color, the quality, uh, the inscription, it had everything going for it. it. Had everything going for it. And it was just a, 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 an amazing example. And you can come over and you can blow it up on the catalog and look at the detail of this thing. And um, it was just a, a great result. That's all you can say, all right? And uh, then move over here. Um, there was this, the uh, mallet vase, the, the Ming Dynasty uh, uh, lac carved lacquer mallet vase. Uh, again, this was a great example, beautiful conditions. And the Irvings had a huge amount of lacquer, Japanese and Chinese. Uh, they really loved lacquer. They had cases of it. And uh, this was estimated at two to $300,000. It was about six inches tall. And... Um, it ended up um, blowing away its top estimate again and selling for a little under a million dollars. It went for $951,000. Again, a really exceptional result. Not, you know, just, just fantastic, okay? And then we're going to get over here to the, um, this is another piece of lacquer. This was that really great Taoist uh, uh, lacquer box uh, inscribed Chin Lung period. Estimated at 150 to 250 thousand dollars, also from Spinx. All right, Spinx had amazing stuff. If you don't know about Spinx, if because they're out of, they're gone now. They had, they were legendary London dealers, and they had, they had access to the greatest stuff, some of the greatest stuff that ever came out of the market in Europe. And um, um, Mr. Irving was wise enough to spend some time with them, and. Um, this box ended up selling for $1,035,000. So it sold for four times its high estimate, which is uh, quite a feat. But it, was in, it appeared to be in pretty much absolutely perfect condition. And um, that's what th you know, great things, perfect things from you know, great collections bring. All right. And then we'll move over to here. There was the uh, Dali uh, Kingdom, Yunnan Dali Kingdom uh, gilt bronze. Um, this was the, one of the things that it had, it had a big estimate, two to three million, which is not unusual for one of these. These are very, very rare. Uh, several of them have been on the market, though, they have sold in the last few years. And I don't know how many collectors in the world there are for these um, in that price range with that specific type of bronze. But uh, this was estimated two to three million, and it sold for just a, a, a hair under. 2 million, 1.9 million. So uh, what that tells you is it, that includes the buyer's premium. So it means uh, the reserves that the Irving uh, consigners, the attorney, whoever did it, they put their uh, reserves, um, you know, it seems maybe perhaps a, a good bit below the uh, low estimate because they did want to liquidate uh, the stuff and sell it. Uh, they didn't want to run it through again. Smart move. Strong estimates and modest reserves maybe might have been their approach. But uh, this was a beautiful example. And uh, I, again, I don't know how many collectors in the world there are for these, so you don't know why it didn't get up higher. But um, uh, ones in the past have, I believe, brought more than this. All right. And then on to that, this, the uh, spinach green jade 18th century brush pot. Really beautiful brush pot. Uh, fantastic detail. Again, color. The color of the stone on this was superb. Really great example. It was estimated at two to three hundred thousand dollars, and it ended up selling for almost double its high estimate again, five hundred ninety-one thousand. All right. But it was a great brush pot. Really great, great brush pot. And there were a number of good brush pots this uh, last uh, last March uh, at Asia Week that were in auctions. We're going to get to them. We're going to get to that great white brush pot that did fantastically well. But this was a very, very good, uh, strong result for a piece of nephrite. All right, really good example. Uh, they don't bring what what the good white pieces bring, but but they did it did very well. And then you had this Chin Lung uh, Dynasty uh, boulder, one of these great boulders. And uh, I didn't mention this in the video uh, a couple weeks ago, and I had actually meant to, uh, because the carving on this with the uh, Liohan and the uh, recumbent elephant with the vase on its back, 
fairly common, uh, uh, you know, uh, scene. Um, elephants in vases with, his, with the blanket draped over them, and uh, just great quality all around. Un, you know, fantastic quality. Look at the way that these branches were done up in here, and the, and the trees overhanging, and again the color of the stone with traces of russet uh, worked into it uh, to, to, to accent the scene. And uh, it was estimated at two to three hundred thousand dollars, and it ended up selling for a million ninety-five thousand. All right, which is a very good result, but an absolutely great piece of jade. Okay, and then if that wasn't enough, you get over here to the uh, to the other Irving sale, and um, again, uh, more and more great things. Um, let's see here. We'll get to. Uh, was this was the jade sensor? All right, and this was um, this this jade. The estimate on this did puzzle me because the quality of this carving, um, and it's an 18th century jade. Uh, pretty obviously, the color and the quality of the carving on this was just absolutely stupendous. All right, and I was kind of I was kind of wondering why the estimate seemed so reasonable on this. It was estimated at uh, 50 to 70 thousand, and um, apparently everybody thought it was pretty reasonable. It sold for 555 thousand dollars. Uh, but it was it, it may have just been a decision they made uh, or something I don't know um, but there were, this was the catalog the Irving sale had some surprises and then there was the in, in the Japanese area there was this this caught my eye because I, I like this stuff there's this really really wonderful uh, Nagoro uh, lacquer flask this may ping form over here uh, the decoration on it was spectacular and it wasn't estimated that high uh, eight to twelve thousand dollars, but this is a good old, really old one, and the lacquer work on it was absolutely superb. It was 16th century piece, and um, Japanese collectors are apparently pretty uh, much alive and well. It ended up selling for um, uh, almost 15 times its high estimate. It went for 156 thousand two hundred and fifty dollars. But a, a very, very rare example. And it was, this was a good size, too. It wasn't small like some lacquer piece. This thing was 15, almost 15 inches tall. Uh, but, but a great piece of Japanese lacquer. And all of the Japanese stuff in the Irving collection did very, very well. Uh, he was, it was a fairly legendary Japanese aspect to what he collected. And um, all, everything uh, pretty much went through their estimates and, uh, across the board on the Japanese category. So there may be some life coming back into the Japanese art world. <laughs> um, I hope so, because it's, I think it's woefully underestimated. And then we get on to the big surprise. The big surprise was this, was this really uh, great looking, uh, an archaistic pale green russet jade carving of a pig dragon. And these are from the Hongshan, uh, Hongshan culture jades. Um, for some reason, um, uh, Sotheby's gave this a uh, extremely uh, 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 low estimate. Um, uh, I mean, um, uh, Christie's rather. Yeah, let's see, what was the estimate on this thing? Yeah, five to seven thousand dollars, and um, it went up. And I, I was watching when it happened, and I recorded part of it, and I'll show it in a clip here in a minute, um, underneath here. But uh, it ended up selling for uh, um, two point two million ninety-five thousand dollars. All right, it apparently was a real one. Christie's uh, didn't uh, want to. Uh, put it in as, as a period example for some reason, uh, maybe because of uh, the, he had bought this and uh, Mr. Irving had bought this in Bangkok, and uh, I suspect he didn't pay a heck of a lot for it, but um, he got a real one, all right, at a very modest price probably, and it ended up selling for uh, almost $2.3 million, which is a real shock. And just so you know, and I'll link this in the uh, down below here on the video, um, the Value, which is a website in China that does videos, we use them in the newsletter, did a good article on this, um, on this, and a bit about pig dragons and, and Hong Kong culture and all that. Uh, as it says here, it sold for 460 times its estimate. And there's a good art. It's a good article. These these folks put up, folks put out good information, lots of good photographs, and. Um, They'll go into a, they go into a bit of detail on this, but it was it was one of the it was all that everybody was talking about this down in New York after this happened. It was one of the big the big high points of the week for Asia Week, just to show that these things do happen. All right.
And now we're going to slide along over and get into the Christie sale. Okay, I'm going to start with the Cherry Tang collection. Yeah, uh, it, it overall it did fine, 80, 85 percent of it I think sold. Um, there were one disappointment was again the cover lot didn't sell for some strange reason, and, and I have and I'm a complete loss as to why it didn't. Uh, had a fairly modest estimate I thought of three to five hundred thousand um, dollars. It came from the Font Hill collection, and it just didn't sell. So whatever whatever it is. Um, um, maybe someday we'll find out, okay? But the rest of the stuff did great. One of the things that did extremely well was the Femi Ver brush pot with the inscription. Uh, this was an extremely rare brush pot. It was the most expensive porcelain brush pot, I think, uh, Kung Shi brush pot ever sold, I think. I'm not sure. I can't think of one that brought this much. It was estimated at eighty to 120000 and we looked at it before. We thought that I seemed to think that was well within r r reason and uh, everybody apparently thought so it ended up selling for five hundred and seventy two thousand dollars so you know four and a half five times its high estimate um, did uh, just great but it was a superb example and um, it, it, that's how it goes sometimes all right just boom gone all right scholar collectors a wild bunch and then there was this, the nice pair. I like these. This is why I'm going back home. We talked about them before. Nice looking pair of um, uh, Femi Ver Mei Ping vases. Pairs of these vases are pretty rare. Uh, they don't turn up. And these were exceptionally well decorated. And they ended up selling uh, just fine. They went for $100,000, which is pretty good uh, um, uh, for these, I think. I, 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 I don't think they were overestimated at all. I think they sold right sort of in the mid-range of their estimate. But uh, a beautiful pair, beautiful pair of vases. And then, of course, we get back to these. These are the Font Hills, the Font Hill vase that didn't sell. Of course, the irony of it is, is that the, um, if, if the, if the uh, uh, because the brush pot did so well um, at, at almost 600000 um, the consigner on this will actually get about what he w was, ex if things sold within estimate on both lots, he'd be getting uh, actually uh, the same or less money. Uh, because of the, this had an estimate of three to five hundred, and the other piece had an estimate of one hundred eighty to one hundred twenty thousand. So if they, if this sold for three hundred and the other one sold for eighty, he, he, he would have he would have gotten less money if you follow my my logic on this. So we got to keep the vase, and he, he did extremely well on the Femi Ver piece, which is fine. All right, these things happen. All right, and we move on, and then on to this that fantastic banquet dish. This was that uh, the, the one tied to the allegory story about excess and so forth, and uh, just a, a great big dish, uh, 20 inches in diameter, unbelievable quality, and uh, it ended up selling uh, just fine. It went for uh, $187,500, and I can't think of many Qing chargers and dishes that sell for that that are not marked, all right? Uh, this was a, a great result and uh, uh, did just fine, and uh, everybody should be happy. And somebody's gotten themselves a fantastic dish. All right. And then on to the Jungkook collection. Uh, again, no disappointments here. Nobody expected any. Um, everything from Stephen Jungkook's collection has done unbelievably well. They've had multiple auctions. Uh, he was a legendary old school collector. And uh, I think his estate is still selling off some of the stuff. I, I don't know how much yet they had put away. It's hard to guess, but I suspect it's significant still. Um, and this was that great uh, gilt bronze Six Dynasty uh, uh, dragon. It's only about five inches long. These are not big. And it was estimated at uh, 100 to $150,000. It did really well. It brought 375000 Blew through, Blew through it more than doubled its high estimate. A fantastic thing, and then there was, the, of course, the uh, this absolutely elegant uh, Tang Dynasty white marble uh, uh, figure of Bodhisattva. A beautiful example on its plinth, nearly the, the entire base is intact, and it had a six to eight hundred thousand dollar estimate, and it sold for just under its high estimate, just a bit under. It sold for seven hundred and forty thousand dollars. All right, these Tang statues do have a big following. And um, this one was just a little over three feet tall. It looks like it's six feet tall in the picture, but it's really 37 inches. Um, but it's quite, quite, a, quite a statue and, uh, and, and very detailed, remarkably detailed. And that's what really drives them. And then the next thing that did so well in this sale was the uh, very early uh, Han Dynasty um, mythical beast. 
uh, jade and this beautiful color. This was very small, inch per inch. This is one of the most expensive things that sold last week. There it is. It was two inches long, very small. Put your hand out and picture two inches, okay? But very early Han jades of this quality and in this condition and this color color of this and the quality of the carving was extraordinary uh just the best and um which is sort of how the junk home collection was this sold for seven hundred and forty thousand dollars all right that's a heck of a result and uh it uh, uh went you know two hundred and forty thousand over its high a thousand over its high estimate all right just a great thing and then we're going to come over here this was ch important chinese works of art um We'll start with this, the pair of Kangxi Dragon Jars. These were just beautiful. I, I think Chris Sotheby's did a video on these. These were really beautiful. Uh, they were estimated at two to three hundred thousand dollars. The quality of the work was uh, quite exceptional, uh, as you recall. It had these beautiful capped lids on them, and uh, so on and so forth. Just a great color. The color blending on them was superb. The quality of the porcelain, and of course their mark and period. They were estimated at two to three hundred thousand dollars, and they ended up selling for four hundred and fifty thousand. So they went one and a half times their high estimates. Not not a big surprise for those. They're a pair, and they're really really fine. And these are not big jars. Um, they sort of look like oh they could be ten or fifteen inches tall. They're not. These are all four inches tall. Very small. Okay. Great things come in small packages, all right? And then also in here, there were some pieces, more pieces from the Junkung collection, the por some of the porcelain. The other pieces had the earlier stuff that was some porcelain here. And one of the, one of the, one of the great pieces that was in here was this uh, uh, absolutely incredible hibiscus month cup in the Kangxi period. It was estimated at eighty to $120,000, uh, which is sort of the range that these always seem to sell, you know, sell in if they're in good shape. A good a good month cup, you know, seventy to a hundred thousand, hundred and twenty thousand. That's sort of their range, um, um, you know, not predictably, but usually. And uh, this this brought um, uh, two hundred thousand dollars. Okay, the power of provenance is huge on these things, and uh, it did great. All the stuff did great. Uh, there were some other pieces. This uh, pair of guan type. Uh, uh, quadruple vases um, uh, sold for a hundred thousand, which was right in the middle of its estimate. And uh, there was this, the fungu. I believe this also brought a hundred or a hundred and twenty thousand. So, Chin Lung, it all did very, very well. All right, and uh, oh, we're getting lots of notifications today. And um, then we're going to move over to uh, oh, the dragon flash from the Youngman collection. This was a surprise. We talked about this. This was that unmarked. Chinlung period uh, dragon flask, uh, just a, a great one, um, blue and white, superb quality. The thing was just exceptional quality all over. Here it is, all right, just great quality, and uh, it ended up blowing away its estimate and doing really really well. It ended up selling for um, nine hundred and twenty thousand dollars, nine hundred twenty thousand. Um, which is a little bit surprising. Everybody was sort of wondering how would it do without a rain mark because these big moon flasks with dragons typically always have rain marks on them and they always bring about a million dollars or a million and a half dollars. This one had no rain mark but came from a good collection. Uh, Robert Youngman's collection, they were, there was a jade section in New York last week we're not going to get into. You can look it up online. And there's another segment of his collection being sold in Hong Kong. He's originally from the Boston area, um, um, grew up in a collecting family tied to Captain uh, Robert Bennett Forbes. Um, um, his family actually lived not far from where I am right now. He lived in New York most of his life and collected. But a long history of collecting in this family, and they, they bought great things obviously so there you are and now we're going to move over to this this was one of the things that did very very well and not unsurprisingly and had very modest estimate this was had a this was that was the uh, uh chin lung uh sutras of perfect enlightenment by the chin lung emperor pair of them boxed uh three to five hundred thousand dollars which i th i thought was really not outrageous at all for these these are extremely rare and um, apparently uh, the people that have this kind of money to spend and, and the interest in this artwork agreed, and they paid $2,060,000 for these. So they went for about uh, almost uh, uh, 
five and a half times, five times their estimates, uh, did really well, really, really well. But they were beautiful, and there's a, a lot of them shown in here if you haven't had time to go through it and uh, go this way. They're over here, and here, here they are. They, there's an extensive write-up, and if you're interested in this sort of art, uh, you should uh, take a good look at it. And then we'll get over to um, the Guangxu Cup, the, je the jewel, that jeweled Guangxu Cup. And in here, they mentioned that this is the only one known. They were known in the Guangxu period to do this kind of work. And I, I wondered at the time how they gave it a three to $500,000 estimate because they didn't have anything really to base it on. Uh, if you don't have a comp, it's hard to put estimates on things. And um, it didn't sell. All right, it didn't sell. So now they have a better idea what it's probably worth. Uh, uh, for some reason, it didn't get off the ground, uh, though it's not, you know, I can't say it's not beautiful. It's, not, it's spectacular. It's elegant. It's great. Uh, but um, sometimes bidders, um, collectors, if they don't have something to compare it to, um, it, it, it takes a little nerve to step up and spend a lot of money on something that you don't know what previous examples have sold for. And it becomes sort of a business decision, I suspect. But uh, maybe somebody afterwards said, you know, darn, I just love that thing. I'm going to buy it. And they went back and bought it post-sale because it's a, it's a great thing. It's a really great thing. And uh, over time, somebody will certainly write books about them, and, and uh, suddenly um, th these will be highly collected, which is often how it goes. All right. And then on to this. This was one of the big stories of the week. I don't know if you heard about this, but this bronze uh, was uh, in the sale. It was a gilt bronze um, uh, Tang Dynasty uh, example. Very, very early. It was estimated at sixty to $80,000. The backstory on this, that this was bought at a house clean-out sale in, in, I believe, Indiana by a lady in the 90s. And uh, she went to the house to look around, is the story that I read, uh, the interview with her, after the dealers had been there, okay, after the Indiana dealers and local pickers and everybody had been in and out of the house for a day or so, um, she decided to go over and see whatever was left. And this is what was left. And it was sitting on a table, and she believed she paid about 75 bucks for it, just liked it a lot, took it home with her. And then um, and now 20-odd uh, years later, she decided to sell it. And uh, uh, they put it in the catalog with a sixty to $80,000 estimate. And uh, in the end, it ended up bringing um, two million sixty thousand dollars. All right, not bad for a yard sale find. <laughs> Don't you love those stories? No, that's good stuff. All right, and um, um, she's she's not a knowledgeable collector. She just apparently had pretty good taste and, and thought this was this was worth having. Good on her. And um, you know, probably at this point, she's getting ready to retire, so this will certainly uh, be helpful, I'm sure. But uh, what a what a great story! Um, everybody's heard those kinds of stories a few years ago, wasn't it? The uh, the sung sung bowl that was bought for three dollars at a yard sale in Long Island, I think it was, or somewhere, and it ended up in New York and brought a couple of million. So it does happen from time to time. All righty, and uh, then we're going to mosey on over to uh, this, the White Jade Brush Pot. This was that uh, fabulous uh, uh, Qing Dynasty, Qinlong to Jai Jing period. They sort of hedged on the date a little. But what color? Just absolutely great color on this. It was estimated at uh, 800000 to $1.2 million. And uh, not any big surprise. It blew that away and ended up selling for $2,060,000. But just... The color, again, these, these pieces, when the color is this good, this pure, not, not white like paper, but that creamy, slight hint of, not green, but that, that, that slightly tinted white uh, just uh, drives them wild. And the quality of the carving on this was, you know, indisputably really superb. Just a great, a great example. And um, it, it brought a big price, and that's the way it goes. All right, and then on to... The uh, last lot in this catalog was this, was that uh, fantastic pair of Kangxi period um, uh, uh, Ludans, all right? And this was the fellow that had them. He had them in his garden. They're illustrated here at his house. Um, they're 31 inches tall, okay? And these, uh, Ludan was a, a combination of creatures with bear's feet and, you know, uh, different elements and a horn on his head. But great color. The color on these was fantastic because they'd been outside just as they should be. And um, this is the patina they picked up over, this, over the years. And uh, I believe they were bought back in the 30s or something as, as the story went. 
All right. And um, they ended up, they were estimated at three to $500,000, which I, I thought, gee, that's, you know, we talked about that a little bit and seemed, you know, like we're certainly within range. And uh, they ended up doing better than that. They sold for seven hundred and forty thousand dollars. All right. So Asia Week was a, this is this is the, this is the end of it. There's nothing else. There's other stuff that sold. Obviously, I couldn't go through the whole thing. There was so much of it, um, and I didn't want to keep everybody here through the through the through the night going rambling on. So, but it was a fantastic uh, end result. There were some great things. There were some uh, uh, um, some things that didn't sell, and that always happens. And there and there are things that went through the roof, and that always happens too. And there were some good, interesting stories behind the things and how they got to the auctions and who the collectors were, and it always, all that combined makes makes it really interesting, I think. So uh, that was it, and I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, if you haven't subscribed yet here to us on YouTube, please do. And uh, if you haven't joined us over at bitemout.com and signed up for the weekly newsletter and uh, joined the forum, please do that too. Uh, and I'll have links down here, and you can come over and say hi. All righty, and uh, have a great week. And I'll leave a comment if, you have, if, you, if there's anything you want to add to what I've said here. I'm happy to see them. And um, have a good week. We'll be back Friday with the regular weekly video. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.